Hello, and welcome to the SMU Video Archive Series. In this series, we interview members of the uh, SMU community who provide insight into the history of SMU, especially from the perspective of their time at the university. I'm Carter Murphy, and today we have with us Kenneth Shields of the Department of English, once of the Department of English, perhaps I should say Ken. Ken, welcome uh, to the series, and uh, let's, we have, we have about 40 years to cover somehow in the hour ahead of us. Uh, let's begin at the beginning. Uh, how did you come to SMU? You came about the same time I did in, uh, in the early 1960s, I think. Yes, I, I came in, in 1961. I had been um, a Fulbright scholar and was in Great Britain from uh, 1957 to 1959 as uh, a Fulbrighter and then uh, had uh, taught at the University of Kansas for a year and went back to Britain uh, before coming here. And uh, I had met uh, uh, Arthur Hart Harding, we always knew him as Colonel Harding. May I ask, uh, why, did he have a military career? Or why was he called Colonel Harding? I think it was a Southern Colonel. <laughs> <laughs> a, gracious, I, uh, a gracious title. I think so. He had been uh, uh, Senator Fulbright's uh, vice president at the University of Arkansas and uh, had joined the law school faculty after World War II. And uh, I had met him in Edinburgh, and uh, uh, he and his wife um, did a good selling job. And, uh, but I really didn't know anyone in English. My, my ties were to people uh, at, down at Perkins because I knew f at least casually uh, Albert Adler, Schubert Ogden, and John Deschner. Uh, so uh, those why, were actually my ties. Why were your ties more to Perkins than to uh, the, uh, the English, uh, the literature group at that time? Well, my, uh, uh, my time in uh, Britain, um, I, had, uh, I was trained both in uh, the Divinity School faculty and the, uh, uh, the English department. So that uh, this was uh, in your PhD work at yes. University of Kansas, I think. Well, and I'd, I'd actually, uh, although I had done my coursework um, in English at Kansas with a PhD minor in philosophy, which was really philosophy of religion, mm -hmm. uh, uh, then uh, during the Fulbright years, uh, I uh, did more work actually with the. Divinity School faculty at Edinburgh than I did uh, with the English department faculty, which was uh, a fairly small group really there. And you knew of people like Schubert Ogden then and Al Outler and, uh, and, and the others uh, who had come to SMU in the late 50s, I think. That's correct. Uh, mm -hmm. And so there was the sense that this was um, a place that was um, right at the cusp of breaking through into um, a significant place. There was a great deal of, of uh, optimism and excitement really about that. And it was coming to join them and others in um, building the university. And it really was very much that feeling. We've we've been on that cusp for many years, <laughs> though. Though I think I think we've tilted into the into the cup uh, substantially uh, over time. I, I, I think that it was Outler, or it could have been Will State, but I think Outler, who uh, used to say that SMU was like a uh, large, uh, heavily loaded airplane that was on the, uh, uh, the landing strip uh, taxiing to take off, <laughs> and it <laughs> kept taxiing and taxiing. <laughs> <laughs> well, never could quite get off the ground. <laughs> Fortunately, it's a lo it's a long runway. <laughs> At least forty years of it we've seen. Yes, indeed. <laughs> did you uh, did you have to come home from Edinburgh to uh, to talk to the English department before taking an appointment here? Uh, as was fairly typical, really, of those years, uh, and the job market was really very different. Um, I had sent out letters to. 
uh, to 20 different universities and received uh, 10 uh, contracts uh, offered. Uh, and that was without meeting with anyone except in the case of the University of Virginia and the uh, chairman was a friend. Uh, but uh, it was all done by correspondence, no telephone calls, no personal contact. <laughs> I don't well, think even even you, pictures <laughs> you were involved. You obviously <laughs> had strong credentials that attracted attention. What, what was the university, what was the college, what was the Department of English like when you arrived? Well, it was uh, uh, largely made up of a group of professors, uh, all of whom had taken their undergraduate degrees at SMU. This is the it Department was, of English. Uh, that's correct. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that was characteristic, really, I would say, of most mm -hmm. of the departments in the college at that time. Um, and it was uh, Bond, Brooks, uh, Heron, uh, uh, and John, John Boyer, who was chair of the department. Uh, they had taken their undergraduate degrees here and then had gone to, especially Harvard uh, was the source of, of most of their work. I'm a Heron being an exception. Uh, and uh, they uh, had, had started building new people into the department after World War II, uh, really mm -hmm. that time was the uh, returning GIs and the Quonset mm -hmm. huts down Bishop Boulevard. Uh, Larry Prime was the first one brought was, in was from John Yale. Was John Boyer chairman at that time? Yes, he was, uh, uh -huh. throughout this period. And he brought in Larry uh, Perrine then? And, and then Pascal Covici, mm -hmm. uh, and then... From, uh, uh, from Harvard. And then uh, uh, Pascal was uh, a few months older than I, and I came in uh, then in 61. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, we, we were the first group uh, who did not have SMU f at, for our undergraduate institutions. Mm -hmm. So uh, I was also really very young. <laughs> uh, I was brought in really to replace John Lee Brooks, uh, which was difficult for him. Mm -hmm. Uh, he had been here so many years, and uh, he was very gracious, but he wanted me to continue uh, folklore and 18th century studies the way uh, he taught it in the early 1930s. So uh, understandably, uh, there was some, uh, some um, polite tension. How long was John Lee Brooks around after you came? Did he retire that first year? Uh, no, uh, he st uh, stayed on for, uh, I think, about two, two years. Uh, the university, uh, the university's retirement um, requirements really at that time, I think, required that he retire about 70. Uh, and actually, we, uh, we remained reasonably good friends, really, in of the few years that remained after that before his death. University was a quite different place in those years. I remember every spring, the, uh, I think the entire faculty went somewhere for a, for a picnic. And uh, the, w the women took uh, picnic suppers and uh, we brought the children and uh, mm -hmm. it was a very collegial <laughs> oh. and a familial kind of, kind of atmosphere. Uh, even I uh, faculty Follies, do you remember that? I remember that very well, <laughs> yes indeed. I remember uh, Ben Ben Petty uh, singing from the top steps of Dallas Hall. <laughs> 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 yes, uh, and I would say particularly in, in Dallas Hall uh, itself because uh, there were so many departments uh, in that one in building. The one, in the one, it was almost, oh. it was the prime academic building on the campus, I suppose, wasn't it? Yes, and with all that, uh, there, there was only one set of, of uh, restrooms for the whole building, <laughs> faculty and <laughs> students. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> on the top floor was studio art and art history. Uh, what is now McCord was a derelict area. Uh, 
uh, the remains really of the old uh, university chapel that went back to the beginning of the, mm -hmm. the university. Mm -hmm. Then on the second floor, it was English and classrooms. Uh, and on um, the first floor, uh, there was uh, uh, history, I mean, philosophy, religion, religious, uh, 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 modern, modern languages, classics, the chaplain's office. Then on the, the ground floor, uh, psychology, sociology, uh, quarters for the Methodist student movement, and the Department of History, and the restrooms. <laughs> so we were all well, really Yes, uh, that was a big, uh, that was a big chunk of uh, SMU uh, in that one building. The Department of Economics was over in uh, uh, what was then Adkins Hall, oh, yeah. uh, across the quadrangle at that time. The print shop was in the basement, and the music department had practice rooms there, I will remember. Oh. I remember that. What was too. going on in the university, Ken? That was, that was the time of master planning, in fact, uh, sometime yes. in the early 60s. Uh, uh, it, it started really uh, the uh, Board of Higher Education of the Methodist Church uh, had uh, a visiting committee uh, that, that came, and uh, their responsibility was an evaluation of the university for the church. And this, uh, this committee was made up of uh, very distinguished national people, uh, chaired by uh, uh, a Quaker from Haverford College in Pennsylvania, uh, whose name I can't remember. Uh, and at the end of it, uh, they uh, gave, uh, I remember reading the report, but uh, it, it was, uh, basically a fairly negative report. And the, uh, the chair met with Willis Tate and said, you know, um, things need to be shaped up. Uh, and uh, so Willis really uh, had to show that he understood what a university was really about. And he set about, he turned basic, uh, preeminently, I would say, to the, the law faculty and to Perkins to, uh, to lead an, an evaluation of the university and proposals uh, for new directions. And uh, well, That was the and, famous master plan report that was then the that was drafted plan. by Marshall Terry. That's correct. And, but it, there were a series of committees and subcommittees. It was a rather large group wasn't it, that yes. was involved? Yes, and, and, uh, and it drew on people uh, throughout the university. Uh, I served on uh, one of the committees, and uh, it was a time, uh, uh, all of our time was taken by these <laughs> meetings. Uh, and understandably, this led to a certain uh, tension be between various parts of the university. Mm. Uh, the humanities uh, group uh, felt that, of course, the heart and center of the university should be not only the college, but the humanities. Uh, engineering felt marginalized by it, uh, justifiably. The sciences uh, felt they were, again, uh, on the short end of things, mm -hmm. on the periphery but, somewhere. Uh, but it, uh, but it, but it did pull together, and out of that came the uh, university college. Um, there were new courses. Um, old courses were reconfigured, and and uh, it was an, an exciting time. I, uh, uh, I uh, decided really on the basis of that to to stay at SMU. I was uh, receiving job offers from various places at that time. Uh, as I said, it was a very different kind of job market than mm -hmm. it is now. And uh, I, I think we felt, uh, especially as the younger members of the faculty, that this was an institution uh, of, of real promise and that 
there was a genuine possibility that we were going to, to take off. Uh, at that time, we were saying um, not that we were the Harvard of the Southwest, which the English department sometimes like to say, uh, but uh, Washington University <laughs> uh, was the university that we were modeling ourselves. That was the university on. from which I came when uh, I came to I, SMU. I where I first, <laughs> first, first got tenure. <laughs> but uh, th then uh, once uh, that uh, the uh, the master plan brought in new faculty, but what was maintained throughout that was. A, a commitment to teaching uh, and uh, a concern for the students. Uh, we were late in coming to general education, as I recall, uh, and I was somewhat skeptical of the whole of the uh, of the venture into the university college. Though it certainly made a it it it, it brought back teaching, I think, to the uh, to the fore in the campus, mm -hmm. and that's that's a good thing. Ken, uh, changing the subject slightly, but in order that we can move on, uh, I remember you, you were on the University Ethics and Tenure Committee at that point, and there were, there were some problems. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. I'm not quite sure what, <laughs> when, what the period was of those problems, the mid-60s maybe, or? It, uh, it began, uh, I, I went on the committee when Gene Bonelli uh, and Music uh, was chair of Ethics and Tenure, mm -hmm. and then I was uh, chairman for a very lengthy period, I think um, 10, possibly as much as mm -hmm. 12, 12 years, and then I continued as a member of the committee for another uh, five or six years after that. Uh, Any of the issues that came before that committee at that point that are discussable? Uh, some, I think, or, or at least an outline. Um, we were struggling, um, particularly in the area of, uh, of contracts for faculty, uh, also problems of um, how, how tenure should, should be given and how people were to be evaluated. And it was very uneven throughout the university. Uh, Kerman Hunter, for example, who was chair of the new Meadows uh, School of the Arts, uh, would not give written contracts to the members of his faculty. And uh, this really was a, a terrible situation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Were we cited uh, by the uh, AAUP for that? Surprisingly, it never came up to the, uh, mm -hmm. the a AAUP. Uh, the, uh, it, it was focused as far as the committee uh, on particular individuals. And consistently, the, the provost, and this was really the period of Jim Brooks uh, and Bill Stalkup, uh, were uh, strongly supportive of, of what we were doing, uh, but uh, uh, Kermit was very shrewd. Uh, uh, I can remember Jim Brooks telling me that every time he would have uh, uh, Hunter up to tell him that his services were no longer required, he would bring Alger Meadows with him. <laughs> and how did he know what the <laughs> subject of the, the meeting was? Uh, and uh, there, were, there were tensions, really, uh, in, uh, the, uh, increasingly toward the end of it, as we were moving from uh, fairly lax standards for tenure in, in some parts of the university and certain departments to increasingly rigorous standards and others. So that uh, the question of uh, not just teaching but publications mm -hmm. uh, be, and, and how do you evaluate those and how do we establish uh, um, the appropriate guidelines and the use of outside uh, reviewers mm -hmm. uh, for, for candidates 
And then uh, later in that, particularly in the 70s, uh, the whole issue of, uh, of the role and status of uh, women in the department. Uh, then, of course, at the quieter side, uh, there were uh, individual um, uh, tragedies and, and problems that um, I don't think it's probably helpful for me to go into in detail, <laughs> except to say that uh, uh, I was uh, consistently impressed with uh, the tact and understanding and discretion of, of uh, Jim Brooks and Bill Stalkup uh, uh, with very, very sensitive issues. And these, these what ranged from uh, 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 sexual misconduct uh, in uh, sometimes uh, involving students, um, but a variety of issues there, uh, to uh, uh, problems uh, really of uh, mental stability, I, I think is the best way to describe it. Uh, and uh, they were always uh, humane, decent, and fair-minded. Uh, there was there was never a decision in that uh, period that I felt uh, was unjust or unfair. The Committee on Ethics and Tenure has been useful, I think, uh, to the university as an ombudsman, a a a, a bridge between uh, faculty and the administration, and uh, it's always had to work with discretion, but has been yeah. useful nonetheless. I was going to ask you about. Uh, moving on to the period of the 60s, which we think of as the period of student unrest. Uh, and you were in the forefront of the civil rights group, Ken, on this campus. Well, yes, I was uh, very much involved. I, I, I was a member of the Southern Christian Leadership Con uh, Conference, and I uh, was on the Dallas Coordinating Committee for Civil Rights. And this was a, a, a difficult time because uh, especially uh, in the pre-assassination Dallas period and the, the years between uh, 63 and 65, uh, race was uh, very much an issue. Uh, so uh, it, uh, we, uh, there were incidents around the campus as well as on campus when I came in 61, the only part of the university that was integrated was Perkins. Uh, and there was strong and, resistance and to they had, any they changes. Had, they had broken the, uh, the, the color barrier in the late 50s, 57 that's or 58, I think that's, they admitted their first correct. black uh, student, graduate student. Uh, I do have an interesting story that might uh, uh, show how, how quietly and gently we eased into this. Uh, the first black student was chosen, and she was a very beautiful young woman from Arizona whose father was a physician, very much a middle class uh, she, person. She came as a freshman in the college. That's correct. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, word got out, so the local television people were there with their cameras, and I was there at the, with the freshman desk uh, welcoming the students and putting them in, in uh, uh, classes. Uh, so I knew the young woman's name, uh, and she came, and I assigned her to a class with the television cameras watching. And she left, and 30 minutes later, they said, well, uh, has she not come? Isn't she coming to, to, to SMU? And I said, oh, didn't you notice? She was here 20 minutes ago. <laughs> uh, she was so light-skinned that uh, you would not immediately uh, recognize her as being African-American. Now, uh, side, uh, side part of that, uh, part of her coming, she was uh, asked not to participate in, in uh, social activities, uh, which might lead to cross-racial dating. But the following year, uh, uh, she was helping with registration, and 
uh, I delighted in watching this because it was the parents and the uh, freshman young man would come up to her and she would hand them the, uh, their papers and there was that uh, understandable uh, <laughs> glimmer in the eye of some of the young men <laughs> as they saw this really very lovely young woman mm -hmm. <laughs> who was assisting them. <laughs> uh, but then uh, it was uh, ironically football that probably did more than anything else to, to, uh, to change things and that uh, then uh, the first uh, darker well, skin uh, that was student was uh, a football player. Oh yes, so that's, that's, where the, uh, that's where diversity of course really made its imprint on, uh, on the university because the great talent was often found among black students and, uh, and, and so uh, means were found for them to be admitted <laughs> to the university. What about protests on campus? Were you involved in those at all? Uh, yes, and uh, a, a couple stories might be uh, useful there. Uh, uh, there was uh, protests and uh, uh, pressure on Willis Tate, uh, who was president at the time, uh, to, uh, uh, to recognize and do various things for uh, an increasing number, not that many, uh, black students who uh, were uh, appearing. Uh, and uh, one, of, one of my students, John, uh, John McChesney, uh, who, who is now with National Public Radio and his wife who's head of KQED uh, in San Francisco, uh, he was uh, insistent with me that I just missed my class and uh, joined the the uh, the picketing uh, picketing of of Perkins administration building. I explained to him that uh, I felt a commitment to all of my students, no matter what their points of view were, and that uh, I was uh, I would conduct my class, uh, and so. Uh, at the appropriate time, I went into the classroom, and uh, John and I were the only <laughs> two in the classroom. We held uh, a 50-minute class, and then I went out and joined him on the picket line. <laughs> that's a nice. That's a nice story. The apart from the campus protests, uh, there was. Uh, there were busloads of students who went to Birmingham. That's correct. To protest. Uh, in 65, the Selma to Montgomery March, um, which was a voter registration uh, uh, activity, and a number of students actually went earlier in the week to work in Alabama. And then the last two days of the march, really right at, at, uh, at Montgomery, um, a group of us organized uh, with the assistance of the local N NAACP uh, two uh, Greyhound busloads of students uh, and uh, some faculty. Do you uh, remember the faculty who, who went? Uh, well, uh, Jim, Jim Livingston and Andrew Key from uh, Religious Studies, uh, 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 George Crawford in Physics, mm -hmm. Uh, I was there, Chaplain uh, Claude Evans, Claude Evans. Uh, was there, Fred Carney from, uh, from mm -hmm. Perkins, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, there may have been a few others, but it wasn't a substantial faculty group that went. Uh, there was a certain resistance. Still, that's, a, that's a group of our distinguished faculty, I think. Uh, I felt so, too. Uh, I'll tell one story about Claude Evans, which would, which really gives uh, the character of him, and I think somewhat of the time. His daughter at the time was at uh, Duke, and she had called her father and said, uh, I, "I want you to meet uh, the young man uh, who is now my fiance." And uh, so a place was arranged, and Claude told me about. Uh, about this as we made our way to Montgomery. And uh, he uh, 
quizzically looked at me and said, do you know of anyone in the SCLC leadership uh, who is white? And the only thing he knew about this young man was that he was in the leadership of SCLC. And I said, no, Claude, I don't know of any. <laughs> so uh, after the, uh, the big gathering before the courthouse in Montgomery, and we had returned to the bus, uh, Claude was the last one, the bus was running, the door was open, we could see him coming down, and he slipped into the seat beside me as we started off, and said, he's white. <laughs> but I greatly admired that he never asked his daughter <laughs> what the race was. Uh, but that was, uh, that was really an extraordinary experience. Uh, uh, Bert, Bert Moore, who was um, Dean of uh, Social Studies uh, or the Social Sciences at uh, UT Dallas, was a student at the time and was vice president of, of his fraternity. And uh, he uh, was going to go on the trip and the chapter uh, said he was not and locked him in his room. And he, a second story room, and he succeeded in getting out and literally shinning down the downspout <laughs> and, and came with us. <laughs> Ken, I want to ask you about uh, Donald Shields, who was president of SMU. He was a relative of yours. Yes. And, uh, what can you tell us about uh, his administration and uh, his personal problems? I, uh, uh, something from the perspective of the family. Sure. Uh, uh, it was uh, a difficult time for me in some ways because uh, Don, uh, Don and I were first cousins. His, his father was my closest uncle and had lived with my parents at one time. Uh, but, and he was particularly close to my older brother, who uh, uh, Don's uh, uh, only sibling uh, was an older stepbrother, uh, my older brother's age, uh, and died during, uh, uh, at Guadalcanal. And so Don was this uh, uh, youth who uh, all of the family's uh, attention really focused on uh, and he had done uh, spectacularly well, really, uh, with his PhD at, at, at UC Riverside. He, he and I were the first, uh, uh, I was the first uh, to graduate from college in my family, and uh, uh, Don and I were the uh, first uh, to do advanced degrees. Mm -hmm. Uh, so f there was always uh, uh, various ties like that. Uh, when he came, uh, I think both of us were a little awkward at first. Uh, there were uh, funny occurrences. He got my mail and I got his, <laughs> which led to some uh, humorous <laughs> exchanges. Uh, and. Uh, uh, he moved his parents here as well, and my wife and I really were the ones who got them settled and found them uh, a place to live and so on. Uh, so it was close in, in that regard, and we did uh, various quiet uh, family dinners and so on uh, uh, discreetly. Uh, he, he, he always uh, wanted us to uh, join him in the president's box in the football games. Well, I have to confess that in my 40 years at SMU, uh, I attended two football games. And uh, <laughs> uh, one was my first year, and uh, the other was when I was dating <laughs> uh, uh, the woman who became my wife, <laughs> and never soon. Uh, he was frustrated with that. Uh, but well, football became the great became the great issue in Don Shields' presidency. It, 
uh, really uh, was and painfully so what what people do not generally know uh, is that his health uh, was uh, uh, pre extremely precarious th the last year of his presidency. Uh, his uh, mother was a serious diabetic. Our grandmother was a serious diabetic. So he got it. Uh, so a, he a too was from, diabetic. From mm -hmm. both sides. Uh, at the beginning of that last year, he had a diabetic stroke. And the doctors had told him that uh, uh, he, he had to resign, uh, that his life was at stake. He was starting, uh, he, he was very much involved in fundraising, um, and it, it was a critical moment in, in the campaign. And he said, I can't uh, do that. Uh, I've got to stay with this, and so on. Uh, and he, uh, so they said, well, you've got to cut back in various ways. About six months into that, um, th uh, uh, it was uh, in increasingly clear that um, his health was deteriorating even further. And uh, he uh, would come up to campus, sign papers, and go home. So he was. Uh, on campus, no more than about half a day a week. Really I remember his period. great his his substantial loss of weight. He oh, well, that was he, uh, he became quite sl quite thin uh, indeed, and it was uh, frightening really to uh, mm -hmm. watch this. Uh, he was so athletic all his life, and uh, and so prized uh, physical mm -hmm. strength. This was extremely difficult for him to accept. Mm -hmm. And, and so I was, uh, you know, told I mustn't um, talk about it with faculty, friends, and so on. And I did. What do you think he knew about what was going on in athletics? Uh, uh, it's interesting because uh, after he left, uh, we never ever talked about it until very recently, and. Uh, uh, the last time we were together, which was here, he came for a visit uh, this spring, uh, although uh, uh, there was no publicity you know, associated with that visit for the unveiling of his portrait. Mm -hmm. And he spent several hours uh, with us at our house. And uh, we went over a lot of what had happened. And uh, it was clear. he. He said he knew there were problems, <coughs> that something was going on, and he, that he had confronted uh, uh, Bill Clements. And Bill had said, uh, I've got it uh, in hand and well under control. That's not your business. Uh, now, throughout his presidency, the relationship with Clements uh, was deteriorating uh, with uh, uh, some ugliness and meanness uh, yes, was that, there that was that, that's really very painful. That story is symbolic almost, isn't it, of the uh, relationship between the executive committee of the board and the administration at that time. Uh, exactly. So, uh, and um, and he said, I couldn't, I couldn't challenge it any more than that. And I, I think uh, at some, some level he knew that he needed to just resign, uh, but not just for his health, but um, because of the relationship with Clements and Cox. Mm -hmm. uh, but he, he, he enjoyed the perquisites of being president. He loved the meals <coughs> at the Petroleum Club and playing golf at the Dallas Country Club. It was. Um, yeah. But for one who loves his job too much, that is, uh, that is a, uh, an Achilles heel, it is. isn't it? Uh, very definitely. Uh, mm. he, uh, uh, I was impressed with the way in which he could uh, be, be supportive in terms of the faculty and faculty recruitment. Uh, Bill May, for example, who uh, came. Uh, uh, be, because of Don, uh, Don and Patty flew to New York, where um, Beverly was appearing in a 
Broadway show and uh, uh, spent uh, three days with the Mays. Uh, and uh, as a result of that, uh, Phil came to Beverly to being Bill May's wife. Yes. Uh, uh, perhaps we should uh, And uh, that, that really was a very special relationship. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. He brought in people like Larry Landry on the financial uh, side of the university. Who, well, I think that uh, was a great appointment as well uh, as Bill Mays. And, it, uh, and those are still very strong relationships. Mm -hmm. I uh, was with Larry Landry again you know, earlier this spring and you know, uh, his fondness and, and valuing of Don really uh, is uh, uh, very uh, special. Uh, I would say that uh, also that uh, Don was very sensitive to how difficult this could be for me as a relative and member of the faculty. And uh, he, uh, 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 but he asked us to come over to the president's house uh, the night before they left uh, when he had resigned and so on. And, um, that was very special, and um, that, was a, that was a bitter and difficult time for Don, without yeah. doubt. Ken, talk about the Department of English, if we have a little time in our tape that's left. Um, what was going on? Uh, this again was the 60s. You had spoken of uh, Boyer hmm. having brought in uh, people like Larry Perrine and, uh, and Pascal Covici and yourself. Um, who were the subsequent chairman of the department? Um, the uh, uh, Boyer was replaced. The tradition in the department was that the department chose its own chairman. But uh, because of the conflict between Boyer and, and the university administration, um, he was removed and uh, replaced by uh, a man who was brought in for University College, who uh, began jointly as chair of the English department and head of University College. And then that didn't work out. And uh, then uh, I think Larry Perrine uh, came in as chairman after him. And uh, that uh, went along well until uh, Larry uh, Perrine uh, wrote a letter to the uh, Texas Education Agency revealing that SMU wasn't honest in what they were, how they were describing uh, a couple of courses that were required for teacher preparation and uh, accreditation. <laughs> and, scandal uh, not so, only in football but in teacher <laughs> prep. So, so Larry was fired <laughs> as uh, chairman and. Uh, uh, David Coldwell uh, was yes. brought in from comparative literature, and the two departments were were blended. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, David uh, really was a very effective uh, chairman. Uh, uh, eccentric, odd, uh, resented by some because he was uh, from outside the department, uh, and. Uh, but uh, looking back on it, um, you know, I, I think a very effective chairman. He had a massive stroke in 1968. I remember. And, he and his uh, wife were very kind to me and uh, my wife when we came to SMU and uh, had us to dinner. Yes. And uh, That was characteristic of him. Uh, we were to have our wedding reception at their house uh, two weeks after his stroke. And uh, we... Uh, we continue very close friends with his widow, uh, and uh, during the the years after his stroke, uh, uh, he he came back and taught uh, with great great difficulty a few classes, and uh, we had dinner every Friday night for a couple of years there uh, when he couldn't really speak, but. Uh, and so we became really very close. He was replaced then by, uh, by Jim Early, who uh, uh, really transformed the department. 
uh, so standards for uh, awarding tenure uh, were, were tightened. Uh, our recruiting and the recruiting was really done uh, largely by uh, Jim Early, me, and and uh, uh, and Mars Terry, who had come in to the department uh, about that time, a little before, and uh, it. It was really a great time, I would say, <laughs> and we uh, brought in some very good people, uh, but uh, we were retaining, we were keeping only about one out of, out of ten of, our, uh, of the people we hired as assistant professors, and that was unheard of uh, in the mm -hmm. humanities here. It was very costly. So it was, uh, and deeply resented by some. Uh, I chaired the, the freshman uh, rhetoric program, and uh, we no longer used uh, housewives to to teach those courses, and uh, made that uh, that staff a professional staff, uh, and that was uh, because of Jim Early uh, uh, supporting me and and what we were able to do with that. But then, then Jim became uh, dean of the College of. Uh, humanities and sciences, mm -hmm. and uh, dean he pointed. Of, actually, he was dean of faculty, wasn't he? Dean of faculty. I think he, that I think was, he was. I think he was never correct. dean. That that's correct. Mm -hmm. That was a. But he, it was yeah. like the associate dean or some uh, such thing. Mm. And he, uh, yes, because Brooks was, uh, in, in some uh, way, the, uh, the the figure. I guess in there. Brooks was in the deanship, was he? Uh, or, the provost. You know the. Uh, Jim moved rather from chair to chair out of the Department of Geology. He did. It all came, uh, uh, Claude Albritton told me one time, that it was because uh, that uh, Jim was offered a deanship at University of Minnesota or some such place. And Claude says, if University of Minnesota wants him, why in heaven's name aren't we using him and to put, him, <laughs> put him into administration <laughs> at uh, uh, an early point. Uh. Uh, and, and a very effective administrator, I always felt. Uh, and some people would quarrel with that, but uh, I certainly uh, you know, was gen generally pleased with him. Uh, Marsh then became uh, chairman. And Marsh had a, uh, had a strange entree in the university, didn't he? Because he came from the world of advertising with the Blum uh, group. Uh, that's correct. And came to work for Willis? Yes. In, in fact, he and Johnny Marie Grimes wrote uh, Willis's speeches. Yes. And uh, when, when, <clears throat> when the collection of, of uh, Tate's speeches came out, there was a certain amount of humor, <laughs> both uh, down at Perkins and in the English department, because it was suggested that really <laughs> it should have had <laughs> Grimes well, and Terry. <laughs> yes, well, many many good men have ghostwriters, <laughs> and, uh, and and he was. I, I think Marsh was especially good as an interpreter of the university in positive ways to mm -hmm. the community. It's uh, interesting that in, in in that light that Marsh became. The professor of creative writing at <laughs> SMU, and it's remained so for many years. <laughs> I can remember one time when that was pointed out to, <laughs> to Marsh, <laughs> and well, he took it well. <laughs> uh, Ken, one final, one final direction. Uh, on the basis of your considerable experience in uh, in Britain. Uh, you were drafted into the uh, to administer the SMU in Britain program. Uh, I don't know just when all that began. Well, uh, this was in the early 1970s when international programs really began here. Mm -hmm. Now, prior to that, I had been placing uh, students informally uh, through networks of friends in British universities, uh, and but the. Uh, Program itself, the SMU in Britain program, was actually uh, started and and supervised uh, for the first four years by uh, Tom Arp in English, mm -hmm. and then I was asked to uh, by Neil McFarland if I would um, assume responsibility for that. And uh, we have several programs in Britain. Uh, there's the program at Oxford, which is a summer program. 
and the uh, and uh, Darwin Payne often took people to uh, to London, uh, and they worked on uh, on uh, news on journalism. I That's think. correct. The that law school has had program. some programs there, but the, the SMU in Britain program was, was a program in which we placed SMU students in British universities, didn't we? Yes, for for a full year of study, mm -hmm. and that was different from uh, at the time. All of the SMU programs abroad were SMU uh, taught, conducted uh, programs. Uh, now, uh, so th it. Uh, the Britain program was the first one in which we placed students directly as regular full-time students in mm -hmm. British universities. That uh, uh, it started off really with a handful of students, and and I um, uh, was responsible for it for 25 years. And um, by the time I left, it was. Um, running between 25 and 30 students a year. And that was really uh, more than I could really handle very well. Uh, and the university was losing the tuition, of course, from those students. So that was, that was a program that in, uh, in many ways had a hidden uh, and substantial cost, uh, which I was very sensitive to. And I went uh, uh, privately uh, uh, to talk with Don Shields really about this. <laughs> I said, you know, I felt he needed to be aware and I wanted some reassurance on it. And he gave a very strong endorsement uh, of it and it was really under him that uh, the President Scholar Program uh, began and one of, the uh, one of the perquisites for a student as a presidential scholar was that uh, they uh, would have their full year of study uh, in the SMU and Britain program underwritten. So uh, their transportation. Well, I think both tuition. programs, the uh, the uh, the overseas programs uh, and uh, and the President Scholars yeah. program, have been immensely valuable to I SMU and have uh, helped to transform this institution. Ken, we have only a minute or two left, I suspect. Uh, is there anything else that we should talk about <laughs> that we have time to, time to do? Uh, oh, there, uh, there are many stories. I'm, I would want to say that looking back over uh, the years here, uh, I particularly value uh, the uh, collegiality and the warmth of, of the community. Um, in those early years when I was here, it's sometimes you know described now as the old SMU, and a lot of that uh, of that collegiality is uh, has been uh, lost. I think as as we become more professional. Uh, That's true. Uh, I, people become directed, they're performing for their peers on a national and international that, scale. And that's good. It's, it uh, is. I but the SMU community remains close-knit, does it yeah. not? I, uh, I, 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 for one, value it very highly, oh, yes. very deeply. Yeah. We've been talking to Kenneth Shields, uh, a Professor Emeritus of English, and uh, I wish it could go on longer. Uh, Ken, thanks for being here. Well, thank you for asking me.